first of all, myself. Um, so my name is Malena Ronsted, and um, I've been writing about the Web3 space and working in the Web3 space since um, 2016. Um, and currently, I'm working for Streamer as their PR and events manager. And um, I've, before that, I've worked for various other fintech and blockchain companies. Um, yeah. And today, I would like to talk about my idea how the Web3 can basically um, enter the existing Web2 stack by eating it. <laughs> um, so first of all, what what are the problems we're currently facing in the current Web2 stack? And I think um, many of you might know that, but I just want to recap it again. So I think like one of the big issues we're facing today is uh, sort of this tyranny of terms and conditions. The fact that we have to opt in into services, whether we actually want to or not, there doesn't really seem to be like an alternative for that. Um, and then also when it comes to the data, we are often like, somewhat involuntarily sharing with those services, we also don't really have an option there. So um, we just have to say, yes, I agree. And then we give away our data and our freedoms um, and our ownership over that data. So, um, and I think then one of the big problems with that is that this data ends up being in silos. So only a few companies have access to this data and um, they can then use this data to innovate and to create new services, to gain insights about our preferences. They can sell that data for a lot of money. Um, but eventually at the end of the day, we as creators of this data, we actually don't have that much access to it or control over it. Um, and we also don't have access to this value we are creating. So I think the Web3 here offers really a great opportunity to at least partially change that. Um, so I'm going to float quite an unpopular opinion here, which I think is that, so in my opinion, the Web3 is never going to completely replace Web2. I think the USP of the Web3 doesn't lie in just completely taking over what is currently there with the big tech giants like Facebook, Amazon or Google. I don't think there's going to be like a decentralized social media, for instance, because I don't think that the expertise currently isn't creating new services like this, but it's rather in like creating, for instance, applications for um, microtransactions of money or uh, for data ownership. So therefore, I think the Web3 can rather win over this existing space in the internet by um, partially just replacing the existing parts of um, the internet which we see today. So um, basically what that means is, so you might be familiar with this um, Greek analogy from Greek philosophy, which is the ship of Theseus, and that's why I have this ship here up in the presentation. Um, basically the this analogy or it's rather like a thought experiment. Um, and it's about that if you replace all the parts from one ship with new parts, is it then still the same ship or is it a different ship? Um, and basically, I would like to apply this idea to, to the Web3 space eating Silicon Valley. So what does it mean if we replace some of the existing parts of the Web2 space with some Web3 applications? Or we might not even have to replace some of the parts. We might just new parts on top of it um, instead of completely reinventing the wheel. Because I think, as said, that's probably not really going to work out as we've planned it. And I mean, um, also, if we look at, for instance, the case of Snapchat being very successful with Snapchat Stories. I know Snapchat is not a Web3 application, but just for the sake of the argument. And then Instagram just completely took over this idea and integrated it into their service. So um, I think making the argument of like a Web3 application, which would offer a morally superior um, social media is not really something which people are going to go for. They rather want to see this network effect. They want to be on the network all their friends are on. And if that network then offer, happens to offer um, a service which makes them maybe have better control over their data, that's obviously even better. But um, 
I think therefore it's easier to just integrate those kind of services into the existing Web2. Um, and if we look at the current legal situation, um, we can even see that sort of, at least in Europe, the law is somewhat on our site um, because you probably all heard of the GDPR, the European General Data Protection Regulation, which um, has a really interesting article, which is it's Article 20, which basically allows um, internet users to port their data from one service to another service. So what does that mean? If you, for instance, listen to music using Spotify, you can then um, take that data from Spotify and put it into another service, say um, Apple Music, or maybe there's just another service, you just like it more because they treat artists better, or maybe it's just cheaper, or you just like their UX better. So um, in theory, Article 20 would allow you to take your music library and port that music library from one service to another. So somewhat the legal foundation is there. But um, I've spoken with a lawyer about this um, because I don't know that much about the GDPR. Um, and this guy told me basically that um, the problem with data portability as it is right now is that even if you want to take your service off from like a Web 2 entity to maybe like a Web 3 entity, or if you just want to regain this control over a data, or maybe you want to sell your music preferences, also very interesting use case, um, then that's all not really possible right now because um, as the GDPR stands right now, um, a service like Spotify would have up to 30 days of time to sort of bundle up your data, prepare everything for you and then send it to you. Um, and they could do so in form of an Excel sheet. So um, the problem we have here or you're facing here is um, interoperability of the services and also the speed in which the data is being ported from one service to another service. Um, luckily though, the European Union is thinking about amending this Article 20 through their upcoming EU Data Act, which will come out or which will come into force in 2021, at least if everything goes as planned. Um, and I don't know what the current situation might take a little bit longer for them. But um, yeah, and under that framework, you could then um, hopefully achieve um, something which is being referred to one click rights. So um, that you're using a service and you just click somewhere and you get all your data and you can take it from one service to another service. Um, so even if the law is not 100% on our side yet, we've built um, a demo, which um, I can send to you if you wanna check it out. Um, please hit me up for it, uh, which basically allows you to pull in together with your friends your Spotify streaming data um, and kind of do something like crowd selling your data. So you can first crowdsource your streaming data and your musical preferences, what kind of playlists you're subscribed to, what kind of artists you like, and you can all pull that data together into something which we at Streamer call a data union, and you can then sell this data. Um, so far, we haven't heard anything from Spotify yet. I guess the data union isn't big enough yet, but um, right now it's kind of like in this legal gray zone and we're hoping that um, the EU is going to sort of extend this Article 20 into um, making data portability really like a reality you can make much more actionable than it is right now. Um, so another, uh, use case I would like to talk about is Netflix, because uh, what if individuals would get together and um, create their own data economy and put together um, their Netflix streaming data? So, because so far this data has only been owned by Netflix and um, actually it is quite valuable. And um, what if we use the tools of the Web3 to pull this data together and then sell that data together? Um, because actually um, a marketeer from the UK told me that if 15,000 people would come together, they could sell their streaming data of one year from streaming Netflix. Um, they could sell that for three million pounds a year. That's 200 euros per person. Um, I mean, it's not really crazy much if you count it over an entire year, but at the same time, for some people, that's quite a lot of money. 
And um, also one thing just on the site, later on, I'm going to be speaking about other ca use cases, which are not necessarily about selling data, but which just highlight also the value of pooling in data together. But when it comes to this use case, um, this is like a lot of interesting information which you can crowdsource together, which when it comes to, it doesn't only come to like your preferences, like what kind of shows are you watching or what kind of lifestyle do you have, but also when do you sleep, when do you work and when are you at home and doing your Netflix and chill thing. But in that case, it will be a Netflix and earn because you can actually monetize that data uh, for quite a nice sum of money. So, um, and I think by offering people to sort of pull in their data into data unions and to sell their data, because obviously nobody is forced to do that. But um, I think that gives people the or internet users the freedom of choice, whether they want to sell their data or not. And also it gives them a fair chance to receive a cut in the value they're creating. Um, so for instance, right now, a lot of people are watching Tiger King. If you've already seen that, it's a terrible show on Netflix. I highly recommend watching it. Um, and they could then see that you're binging this right now uh, while being in quarantine. Um, and there's this one character in Tiger King, which is this tiger lady, Carol Baskin. Um, and she says the ownership from property and money comes from doing things in a certain way. Those who do things in a certain way, whether on purpose or accidentally, get rich. And um, the kind of um, reason I chose this quote is because I think what she's saying there about on purpose or accidentally is quite interesting because right now we've been sort of our data has been sold sort of accidentally without us having control over it but we can also sell our data on purpose and then well we might not get rich but we might take a cut of the value we're creating um, and then a company which sort of got rich accidentally by selling user data is Jumpshot. Um, Jumpshot is, you've probably not heard of that company. Um, I also haven't heard of them until recently. They used to be a subsidiary of the antivirus software Avast. And um, Avast is a European antivirus software. Um, a lot of people have that installed on their computer. And by installing Avast on your computer, you basically give that software a fuck ton of rights to see what kind of stuff you're doing online. It gets access to your browser and it sees basically all the data going through there. And obviously, a lot of companies are interested in knowing what kind of websites you're visiting and knowing how long you're staying on a website or in knowing what kind of things you're looking at um, for on Amazon. Um, and basically, Jumpshot was a subsidiary of Avast and kind of made use of all that data being produced from Avast's user and um, sold that data for several hundred millions of dollars a year to companies like Google, to companies like, or but also consumer brands like Pepsi, also consultancies like McKinsey, Home Depot, Microsoft, TripAdvisor, or Yelp. And none of that value which was created and was actually shared with the people who chipped in their data and they weren't even asked about it. There was like this tiny window, this opt-in window where you just tick a box, coming back to the tyranny of terms of conditions, you just tick a box, you don't really read all the information which is being provided to you and you just tick and you say, oh yes, okay, my data goes there and there, but you're not realizing that other people are making millions and millions of dollars with that. Um, and the practices of Jumpshot got now recently exposed in an investigation from Motherboard and PC Mag. Um, I think that happened only two months ago. And um, they basically, as a consequence of that, um, Jumpshot got closed down and their 150 employees got laid off. And right now, there's sort of a gap in the market because this data is no longer being provided. And all those companies, which used to be clients of Jumpshot, um, can no longer get this data from anywhere else because there is no such a thing which is collecting all this data to such an extent as Jumpshot did previously. So um, a data union which has been built by a team from Turkey which is making use of Streamer's data union framework is um, it's called Swash and basically it's trying to fill this gap but it's trying to turn this thing upside down. 
So thinking back of uh, Tiger King, Carol Baskin, who says you can get rich either accidentally or on purpose, this is the case now where you can sell your data on purpose. You won't get rich with it though, but you can sell your data on purpose with this. Um, and basically it's a browser integration, which you can install in any browser. And then you can choose what kind of data points you wish to share and which data points you wish to keep private. So that could be what kind of things are you looking for on Amazon? What kind of videos are you watching on YouTube? Um, that could be what are you searching for on Google? And right now, this data is being siloed off because only Amazon knows what people are searching for on Amazon. But if you are a startup and you want to get like ahead in the game and maybe also start an online business uh, where you want to sell physical goods, um, it will be very valuable to know what kind of things people are looking for on Amazon. And then you could subscribe to this um, data package and um, gain new insights. Um, and I think there is also beyond that, there is there are so many other use cases where this could help researchers, where this could help universities, where this could help governments. Um, by just opening up the access to those kind of data sets. Um, also, another important thing, I don't know if I've mentioned that yet, for Swash, you can also add in a delay so your data isn't sure, shared instantaneously, but maybe only after 10 minutes, so you can choose whether it's being shared in real time or whether there is a delay built in, which I think is important as well, because you might be doing something and then you realize, oh crap, I actually don't want that data to be shared with everyone, and then you can just delete it. Um, so, in return for your data, you're getting paid in crypto. And um, because you're providing your data in nearly real time, you're also being paid nearly in real time for your data. And um, I think that also cycles back why, <clears throat> excuse me, why we need Web3 applications and why we need blockchain in order to actually make this happen. Because um, if you think of the current fiat banking system, it's just not fit for handling microtransactions, and it's also not fit for handling thousands of transactions a time for micropayments. Um, so if you think back of the Netflix example, where you have 15,000 users being in this Netflix data union, it's impossible to pay them all while they're watching a certain show, but you would have to wait until a certain interval and then pay them. But then you would still have the transaction costs and sort of the administrative headache of doing this. Whereas um, using blockchain, you can just automate all of this and pay people instantaneously for their data. Um, and at Streamer, our developers have used this um, framework, which is called Monoplasma, which is an Ethereum sidechain technology, which can be basically used for um, what we are calling broadcasting money. So you can send um, microtransactions to millions of people at a time. Um, in like a continuous stream. So while you're streaming or broadcasting Netflix, the money can be broadcasted back to you. Um, yeah. And as I've already mentioned, there are lots of different use cases for data unions. And I don't think it has to be always about selling your data. So I think the main focus should be on what kind of value can we together create um, by providing this data. Because right now, this data is only owned by the tech giants. But think of what's possible for researchers, startups, governments, SMEs, if they all get access to the data, which is currently siloed off. Um, and I think also, if we think of the current pandemic, which is going on, um, there is probably a lot of data points which would be interesting, uh, which we could then crowdsource and then make them accessible to, to researchers or to governments. Obviously, people need to have the right to opt in or to opt in. I think that should be stated very clearly wh whether people want to pull in their data or not. Um, but yeah, I think in general, data unions are a great tool to sort of integrate this way of pooling in data together and then sharing this data with others on a marketplace and um, in some cases getting paid for that data. Um, so yeah, if you are interested in, in building your own data union, we do have a community fund at Streamer. So if you have an idea where you're saying like, 
hey, this example of Netflix is really cool. I want to build a Netflix data union. Um, then we're happy to uh, support you with some funding for doing this. Or if you have maybe like a really cool idea for a COVID-19 tracker um, using this data union framework, then I'm also happy to uh, put you forward to um, the people who are administrating our fund. Um, yeah, and I think that's already it. I'm looking forward to hearing your questions if you have any. Uh, you can reach me at malena at streamer.network or you can find me on Twitter at Runstead. And yeah, thank you very much for tuning in and I hope you're all staying healthy for wherever you are. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Malena. Thanks for your talk. Now, do we have any questions in the channel, in the interspace or in the chat? Okay. Anybody in the so there was somebody uh, or there was a mention raising hands, but I'm not sure if this was a question. No. So I, but perhaps Marlene, I would be really interested to hear your thoughts on COVID nineteen. I mean, uh, in many, I think in many. Um, European countries, there's currently the discussion if we should use data tracking for, uh, well, getting um, control, um, yeah, the, the, the spread of COVID uh, and maybe other um, epidemics like this. So, and, and of course, everybody looking to Asia where, where they have a much better access to data. So, do you feel that you are suddenly that your conversation around such data unions is a different one. Maybe it's pretty early, but maybe you already had some first notion on it. Um, yes, so I think there is kind of the debate around whether data should be now opened up because of COVID-19. Um, I think it's kind of split, right? There is this one camp which is saying, yes, everyone should now pull in their data, whether it's voluntary or not for the for the greater good in that sense um, so people are getting quite utilitarian about it and on the other hand side you have people saying like no this is my personal freedom and privacy and it should not be violated um, and I do agree that in people should still opt in um, and have the ability to say no to that um, if they don't want to pull in their data I mean at the same time things should go hand in hand right now with the current measures which have been taken already as well, right? Because in most European countries, we have a lockdown anyways, um, where you're only allowed to go to the supermarket or going for a walk. So I think um, going forward, what I could imagine what would could come from some governments is like, well, you're allowed to go out if you're using such an application. And if you're then tracking and tracing with whom you're getting in touch. I personally would rather prefer a version where people can voluntarily opt in because as much value as there is in like providing this kind of data points, I think there is also always space for abuse. And if somebody for some reason does not want to share this data, but has still a reason for going out, um, then they shouldn't be forced to share that. So yeah, I think it's a very tricky question. Yeah. And then there is a second question on that. I, I was wondering, I mean, there's always this difficulty in encouraging people to use services like that, to use, to create a data union, to aim for monetizing their own data. And this is somehow weird because you feel like, hey, um, are you really fine that your data gets exploited and you, you just don't see anything from it? Uh, and, and other companies are creating loads of revenues based on that. And I felt this was also a little bit the discussion, at least in Germany, where we had had a huge or still are having a huge discussion on, oh, is the government, is it really a good idea to grant the government access to such sensitive data? And should we do that? And on the other hand, it's, it's just ridiculous because LinkedIn is doing it all the time. The services are tracking your location all the time. So, I mean, it feels like 
it's totally unbalanced. Uh, maybe this is a matter of education as well, but I felt um, maybe the best thing of this discussion is that people again are getting aware of it and, and are willing to take responsibility. But then the second question on, since we're talking economics, are the incentives and the revenues I might be able to create enough to take the responsibility and the effort of managing it? Hmm. So I think when it comes to the incentives and the money which people might be able to eventually make, I think it's a fair point because I think for some data sets like the, the Netflix data set I mentioned, the 200 euros a year, I think that becomes quite attractive for a lot of people, I think especially younger people. Um, whereas with the um, other application I introduced, Swash, you probably won't be making more than a couple of euros a month with it. Um, however, there has been a study by the American economist, uh, Jérôme Lanier, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. He has a French name, but he's American. Um, he is arguing that you can, he's arguing in a New York Times article, actually, that you can make uh, 20,000, uh, like a, four, a family of four in the US can make $20,000 a year. Um, so I think that is definitely a strong economic incentive. Um, he bases that again on another research, which I haven't read, um, where people explore more of the details of how this figure comes together. Um, and I wonder also when it comes to that figure, whether that means that there are certain data points, you just give them away once and you get that money, or whether that is an amount you can expect on a yearly basis. Because I think some data points, once you've revealed them, I mean, most people, for instance, they don't move location every year they move maybe like every five years or every 10 years um so that information can only be sold once and never again um so i think it is um it is definitely there is definitely an economic incentive but i guess also then one of the critiques which has been on when it comes to selling data is that at the end of the day people are going to be more likely to sell it. Those people are going to be more likely to sell it who need the money, whereas those who don't need to sell it, they just going to rather opt in for their privacy. However, as you just said as well, is everybody's selling it already. So Google is selling that data, LinkedIn is selling it, Facebook is selling it, all those other services are. Um, and I think, so one aspect is the financial and the monetary aspect of it and the value of that data. But the other one is, and that's more intangible, and I wonder what future incentives for that could look like. But the other aspect is to sort of um, open up those data sets to researchers, to new startups, to SMEs, to um, for um, machine learning or AI learning, um, because currently those data sets are closed off and not that many people have access to it or you have to pay high amounts of money for getting access to this data and i think that like in the name of science could be another incentive but honestly i wouldn't really know yet how a good incentive could look like because obviously you will let, then have to incentivize people to download that to install this to like be a member of this data union and those are already quite a lot of steps, which I don't assume every individual would take just to like make some SME profit from that data set at the end of the day. So yeah, it's a tricky question, <laughs> but I hope we can solve it going forward. <laughs> yeah, absolutely valuable. So um, I, I'm not sure if you are going to take part at the Covidaton with Ocean Protocol, since this is also around data privacy and fighting COVID. Um, we are actually taking part in a different hackathon. There are so many hackathons around yeah. this topic right now. So since most of our developers from Streamer, they're mostly in Helsinki in Finland, and uh, the Finnish government has also a hackathon set up. So they are participating in this one with two different teams. So um, yeah, but they're they're working on some solutions as well, hopefully valuable ones. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's uh, of course now a lot of activity around that, but hopefully also a lot of new creative ideas how dealing with it. 